With that ongoing support that we have from the NHMRC, that will then allow us to continue to provide educational opportunities like this and others, uh, as I'm sure many of you would have seen over the recent, uh, the recent years. Uh, this year alone, we've had uh, as many as 10 different educational opportunities. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Susie Parker. Welcome, Susie. Susie is one of our star researchers here at uh, UQCCR, and she has a, a very strong research program based at the Queensland Children's Hospital as well, whereby she's looking for uh, innovative methods to ensure that we can deliver optimised dosing to paediatrics and neonates got um, quite a program running out of the Queensland Children's Hospital where we're looking at um, antimicrobial optimization and trying to find the best dose to suit the different patient groups um, in paediatrics. And so um, our first speaker this evening is uh, Dr. Tony Lai from Westmead Children's Hospital. He's an infectious disease and antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist. Uh, he also has a clinical lecturer role at the University of Sydney uh, School of Pharmacy and Sydney Institute for Infectious Diseases. Uh, and he's got an interest in antifungals in immunocompromised children and therapeutic drug monitoring. Thanks, Uzi. Unfortunately, I, um, I don't have a postdoc yet, but I will, I will be doing one, so I'm not a doctor yet. Thanks for the opportunity, Jason and Susie, for uh, speaking tonight uh, about antifungal optimization in, in children. So first off, I just probably, I want to set the mood. Um, why is it important to know about this, especially in peds? There's been a lot of um, advances in, in, in the treatment in, in, can in cancer, in, especially in children and bone marrow transplant, but I, arguably uh, it's not quite the same amount of progress and advances in the treatment of and prophylaxis of invasive fungal disease. So um, why else is it important? It's important because the incidence of IFDs is not rare. So there's, there's been a really nice uh, prospective multi-center um, study in, in Europe published recently, which showed that children with uh, leukemia or have had a bone marrow transplant uh, had a rate of IFD of around 6%. How does, how does this compare to us Aussies? Um, oh, uh, but before I get to that, I guess um, the, the risk increases um, if you look at subgroups of re relapsed ALL and certainly um, um, AML where, where the incidence of IFD is, is higher. But as, a, as I was kind of getting, getting ahead of myself is that um, What's the incidence like of IFDs um, specifically in, in AML, ch children of AML uh, in Australia? And there's in this really um, nice um, retrospective study by uh, Daniel Yeo, who's one of the pediatric ID physicians currently working at Perth, who, who did a 10-year look back on all the IFD rates in, in AML children in all the pediatric hospitals in Australia, except mine, which I'm quite sad because I would love to have contributed. But he found that it was about one in five. So one in five a children treated with AML had uh, you know, an incidence of IFD of around 20%. And this is despite being on antifungal prophylaxis. Um, but most of the sites were using fluconazole and itraconazole as their primary prophylactic regime. And, and one would argue that this is probably not translatable to um, sites that would be using posaconazole as their primary prophylaxis regime, which is what is recommended in most up-to-date consensus guidelines. So uh, what's also quite important is, I think um, uh, Jason did a, a nice segue to is that um, the the, IF, uh, the IFD mortality associated mortality of IFD in children is not it is it is significant, and and certainly what's been uh, shown in the prospective analysis in, in Europe was is around sixteen percent. What Dan found was it was around eight percent in Australia, in, in in children with AML, and, and the the top three um, causes of these infections these IFDs. 
not, not of the mortality, but of the IFDs was Aspergillus candida and Lamentospora prolificans, uh, which is previously known as Scytosporium prolificans. And my microbiologist friends tell me that the cool kids call it Lompro. So these, these kids have Lompro infection. And this is despite best available treatment. So what is the available treatment in children? So we've got a IV ambazone, we've got voriconazole that comes in a nice suspension. We've got the aconocanins where most of the evidence is around Casper and mica. We've got fluconazole, which comes in a suspension. Uh, we all know POSA comes in a suspension. We use tabinafine sometimes. It only comes in a tablet, which you can crush. And this new kid on the block, isoviconazole, which is available in a, in a tablet that can be crushed that has relatively good absorption. But most of these, or the ones asterisk, we use them despite not being licensed in children. It's not licensed by the TGA, FDA, or EMA. Um, so why is that? Why are antifungals overlooked in the, in, in the randomized controlled trials that lead to the licensing? Unsurprisingly, it's due to money, return of investment. These studies cost uh, millions of dollars. They take a lot, a lot of time to put together. And also the investigators and the drug companies want to maximize their chances of success of the primary endpoints they're trying to show in their study. So therefore, most phase three studies, most phase three RCTs will have an exclusion criteria of at the age of less than 18. So what do ped, ped clinicians like myself do? How do we work around this? So you get your fancy new antifungal that's been uh, you know, um, licensed by the FDA, TGA or whatever. Um, we have to wait for clever people to do PK studies. These PK studies, they need to, they essentially, the, most of these studies look at um, uh, what dose can we give to kids that give us a similar um, similar AUC or exposure to what was initially found in the adult phase three RCTs. And then subsequent to that, um, they do open label non-comparative studies where the primary endpoint is generally safety. Um, you know, the secondary endpoint is an efficacy endpoint, but not, not as higher quality um, evidence compared to a randomized control trial with the with the comparator of a gold standard or placebo, and then they send this to our licensing agencies, and then um, it comes to me to use for my patient on the bedside. Sometimes these these um, these PK studies might have um, secondary um, efficacy safety endpoints that are good enough for FDA TGA approval. Um, but as you can imagine, this takes years, up to ten years, to reach me at the bedside. So what we do to work around this is that we have to use these, you know, quite low quality type of evidence literature um, to use it in our patients. So we, we use these studies, but as a good quality assurance measure, we use therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, here's a really nice uh, narrative review published by David Andes. Um, as we all should know, David Andes is your author who did that pivotal trial in candidemia, removal of lines, superiority of ekine cannon. So he knows what he's talking about with Canada. And he, he did this, he's got this really nice table which really describes the target pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic indexes for our antifungal. So with am amphotericin, it's peak. Uh, triazoles and echinocandins is an AUC. I guess one of the take home messages from this slide is that uh, the target PKPD for an azole is 25, 25, 25, 25. And then a bunch of the you know, TDM, TDM rock stars all got together and developed this um, position statement, which I commonly reference. Um, and it's a really nice summary, um, and which is quite, quite consistent with David Andes' initial na narrative review, showing the target PKPD and also um, the clinical target troughs of the three azoles, for example, and some descriptions of toxicity thresholds. And these are, most these are consistent with most 
uh, consensus antifungal treatment guidelines. Okay, so um, let's use this as an example. So case in point, voriconazole. So voriconazole, Raul Herbrock did the, um, the pivotal RCT showing that voriconazole was superior to conventional amphotericin in, in aspergillosis. This is still to this day cited in every single aspergillosis consensus guideline. Um, and a few years later, Tom Walsh did a, a PK safety study which showed, oh, yeah, we could probably get similar levels um, in kids and it's safe. So, yeah, that's, that's good enough for TGA approval. Um, and then subsequently, there were some more studies that show that it was safe and tolerable. But as you can imagine, this this, you know, uh, uh, the, the initial randomized control trials 2002, it took a really long time to really get to that T, um, TJ approval and, and you know, really strong evidence to show that it was safe. So what, what were we, what were us uh, pediatric clinicians doing in the meantime when we've got our, 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 our child with uh, pulmonary aspergillosis are we going to give arguably more nephrotoxic, expensive, um, um, uh, less efficacious drugs for this type of severe infection associated with high mortality? So we're having to use these phase one, two type of trials. And there were subsequent trials that were done later that, that I can talk about um, and unpack. But um, this is where we... We use these, these PK studies and we use therapeutic drug monitoring as our quality assurance. So, so before I get into the more nitty gritty details of that, what are the main differences of voriconazole when we use it in kids versus adults? Um, one of the main things is that kids need much higher doses when you're looking at megs per keg. And this is well described in the literature. So if we're looking at adult doses, those typical product information starting doses, and then looking at a a, a Korean RCT um, of voriconazole with TDM as the main intervention. These are the, the typical doses you would give to an adult to get target levels. But in kids, uh, one can see um, that you need much higher doses per day, meg per keg. And it, it's really the younger kids that need much higher doses. Um, one thing that's also important uh, that uh, is really um, described poorly in the earlier literature is that uh, if, if you look at the older literature, you know, it's still in some UCAS documents and in some tertiary literature, they'll say that uh, adults have linear, uh, adults have nonlinear PK and children have linear PK, but that's just simply not true. And that's um, you know, well described by uh, Lena Freiberg and Michael Neely. Um, voriconazole, like adults in, and in children, it has nonlinear PK. So what does that mean? It means that um, a, a, a dose increase is not uh, direct, exactly proportional to the increase in con concentration when you've reached a saturation point. So there's a certain, certain threshold. So that's because Voriconazole has saturable metabolism. So once you've saturated met, met, the metabolism, um, you know, your doubling of dose is not going to equal a, a doubling of the concentration in our child. And this is where the utility of um, TDM is really strong. So how effective is Voriconazole TD, TDM in children? So there's two key studies, one by the Dutch, um, and um, it, it, they, they really showed that um, you really... Uh, Achieve targets generally within two to three dose adjustments, assuming you do your steady state level at 72 hours and you get a good turnaround of the level. But then um, in Australia, there's this really nice um, retrospective study done at the Royal Children's in Melbourne by Alison Boast and supervising also is, is, is Amanda, one of their um, speakers later tonight. And, and she showed that only one in two of them were achieving target voriconazole levels when TDM was done correctly. What does that mean? That, that the steady state was a true steady state and the trough was a true trough. So one in two. So, so what is it about this 20% or 50% we struggle with? Um, what's causing it? And 
in one word, it's really variability. So variability in the drug interactions, uh, voriconazole is a CYP2C19 substrate. If you give inhibitors or inducers, you've got to play around with those levels. Um, you know, well description, there's good descriptions of omeprazole boosting voriconazole levels and even recent descriptions of flucloxacillin are playing around with um, voriconazole levels. Um, what's been described in the adults and also in the children is your degree of inflammation also affects your voriconazole um, concentration. So this is the, the intra-patient variability. So we're talking about the same patient here, still getting um, different levels despite same doses. And also the effect of food, taking it on an empty stomach, you get better absorbed in than taking it uh, with food. Um, and then there is this phenomenon that is also described in children and adults is auto induction, where it just starts inducing its metabolism. And then usually voriconazole when given uh, in long durations, there's some patients where you'll notice that the levels start declining despite being on the same dose and no other uh, new drugs started. Um, and as I mentioned, the nonlinear PK uh, is due to the saturable metabolism. And what's quite unique um, for pediatrics is you're going to get much different levels if you switch from IV to oral. And this is um, described really well uh, by this graph done by Michael Neely, where, where IV um, voriconazole is not equivalent to the oral voriconazole when given in children. So here we can see... Um, adults versus kids, uh, where they've um, compared the AUC of IV versus the AUC of oral. And there's a large variance in, in the um, bioavailability in children. And uh, what's, what's the take home for me, especially in my institution? So whenever we switch from IV to oral, we increase the dose by 1.5 times and, and do um, uh, ag aggressive TDM. Okay, so how can we further improve this, you know, 20 to 50% despite, uh, you know, doing therapeutic drug monitoring? Well, I feel like one, uh, clinicians um, in this space should have an appreciation of this intra-patient um, uh, variability due to these factors. Uh, and, and also the inclusion of dose optimization, TDM, in your AMS service. And if you're in the business of AMS, you should be in the business of dose optimization and TDM, especially with voriconazole. Because we all know that when, when, when uh, vorio levels are done, it's usually interpreted by your most junior medical officer and they adjust the dose. So it's a good value add type of service if you include it in your AMM, AMS program. So what about Bayesian forecasting? So, you know, there's a lot of um, chat about um, AUC monitoring of VANC, Bayesian forecasting, using fancy software. Um, there are some descriptions by Michael Neely and William Hope of the potential benefits of Bayesian in, of, of, in children with the use of voriconazole. Um, you have the additional benefits of doing levels that aren't troughs. You don't have to wait till it reaches steady state. You can accurately um, calculate the AUC where we know that the um, PKPD index of VORI is uh, AUC over MIC. And um, I, I would hope that clever people like Michael Neely and William could, could start um, uh, include a covariance like, oh, if I give this patient um, omeprazole, if this patient wasn't eating any food um, into the data input of the Bayesian forecast to really give us a much more accurate dose recommendation. So changing tune, let's talk about posaconazole. So posaconazole is available. We use it in kids, despite it not being licensed in kids. Um, so we all should be familiar with Oliver Canelli's uh, pivotal RCT showing that posaconazole was superior than fluconazole and itraconazole in preventing IFDs in, 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 patients, for, in patients with AML, and this is in, in adults. But what was quite atypical um, in this RCT compared to most other RCTs is they had an inclusion criteria of adolescents above 13 years of age. Um, so this study showed you know, a significant um, uh, mortality and um, a lower rate of IFDs when you gave posaconazole compared to the other two azoles. Um, and 
and then there were some studies um, coming out later in kids, um, although they were admittedly quite small numbers uh, patients. Um, just these, these minor PK studies showing that, oh, well, what type of dose can we give to give similar targets, uh, target attainment to, to what was described in the original RCTs. So, um, so at, at Westmead Children's Hospital, we were quite early adopters of posiconazole for prophylaxis, especially in AML. And, and we, we're not gonna wait for the TGA approval. We started using posiconazole quite quickly and we used TDM as our quality assurance. So um, yeah, we've been using it for over 10 years with TDM and um, in prophylaxis of AML, aplastic anemia. So similar indications to, to, to adults in the treatment of um, zygomycosis. Um, and we thought we can't just start giving it and not evaluate it. So we looked, we, 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 we evaluated. We, we looked back to over five years for all the, all the children that were given posiconazole for prophylaxis. Our age range was between three months to 12 years with the primary endpoint looking at how, how many of these patients were achieving targets. Secondary endpoint was the breakthrough infection rate. So what we found was um, only 50% were really getting target levels. Why? Um, because yet again, variability. Um, variability due to um, nasogast patients getting nasogastric fees or associated with low levels, drug interactions, so the drugs that were um, increasing your pH, like you know, omeprazole and reninidine at the time, even and even uh, prokinetics like metoclopramide were, were associated with lower achievement of target attainment and lower levels, GVHD, mucositis, diarrhea. So these were all associated with lower levels um, in our cohort of patients. In terms of IFD, we found that four out of 100 patients had a breakthrough infection on posiconazole at Westmead Children's Hospital. And this was not too dissimilar to what was described in the adult uh, Oliver Canelli um, RCT. Um, what we did do, which um, didn't quite make to print, was we did this regression analysis where we tried to um, um, show the association between trough level and your, your and predicted probability of breakthrough infection. And uh, um, uh, what, what uh, we have, on, uh, so what we have on the y-axis is your is your percentage rate. Uh, X-axis is your 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 mean posiconazole level. Um, and um, what what I found quite interesting was if we were to extrapolate that that line to posiconazole level of zero, so no posiconazole, so no prophylaxis, um, we it, it looks like it, it, it's consistent with what's been described in Australian guidelines of, of these type of patients will have an IFD rate of greater than 10%, um, which is quite cool to show. So, um, so when we published this study, like most, most things in the um, research publication space, as soon as you publish something, everyone else wants to publish something and they publish better studies than you. Um, so Antonio Arrieta did a really good study um, I have a feeling that he was one of the peer reviewers. Um, he, uh, he, he, he did a, a, a non-randomized trial, which was really good enough for FDA T TGA approval uh, of its use in children. But what, um, and there was an also another PK modeling study done in by um, uh, University of Queensland. Um, but what was re uh, a really good study that I wish I could have done um, subsequent to the uh, five-year look back retro study um, was this study by the, done by the Belgians. And this is published recently. And they've got this beautiful curve here. So let's look at this curve. So it's posiconazole PK, probably a target attainment, looking at different doses and different frequencies, and also looking at the legend, the effect of diarrhea and the effect of PPIs which seems quite consistent with my findings, but it, it just portrays it so well. And really the take home message from this slide is if you are having troubles giving posiconazole prophylactically in your children, you should bump up the frequency. Um, and also one of the take homes is um, uh, doses above 24 megs per keg 
really lacks benefit of increasing your uh, your target attainment um, percentage. Um, so that suggests to me that that's probably the, the saturation point. So the nonlinear PK. Um, this is the second um, graph that they had in their study, which looked at absolute dose, so not megs per keg. And what I've highlighted here is you can see that this is the saturation point of 300 megs um, per 300 megs per dose QID. So for a child who's on positive conical suspension, they should never be on doses more than this. You're just wasting money. Um, and um, this paper showed it really well. Um, and this is just consistent with what our understanding that it's got saturable absorption. Okay, so how, how does this affect me on the bedside? So um, Amanda Gwee has done a nice narrative review around this. So, so I've just summarized some, some Amos Pharmacist hacks on improving posoconazole levels uh, in our children. So obviously um, increasing the frequency, adding ascorbic acid has been described, um, giving like a decent amount of fat. So whipped cream, 10 grams of fat per dose and, and, and stopping uh, your PPI, which is often difficult in these type of patients because they're going to be on corticosteroids. They're going to be on the omeprazole to um, prevent um, steroid induced um, ulcers. And um, Think about uh, ceasing the formonidine and, and, and not using metoclopramide, use Zofran as, as an example. And um, go hard on the on the increasing doses. Go uh, So go up to 25 megs per, keg per, uh, per dose QID or a max dose of 300 megs per dose QID. All right. So that's all about the posiconal suspension, but something that's coming soon that I'm really excited about is this new posiconazole powder for suspension, which is actually recently TGA approved for two years and above. And this is probably why they um, they ditched the PBS um, PBS um, uh, approval uh, for posiconazole suspension because this is coming out soon. Um, and so it's a delayed release oral suspension, and it's got levels that you, similar levels you can attain with giving it IV. And um, and it will make uh, parents a lot happy because you give it once a day after a BD load. And um, it's dosed at six megs per keg per day. So a much lower total posiconazole dose yet achieves better levels. So here's the, um, the, the, the you know, the, the phase two to th three that uh, PK safety study that led to its FDA approval. And one can see from the graphs that um, you're getting similar levels to IV. And most importantly, 90% of children had target levels. And this is much better than 50%. So this is probably where posiconazole. So I think there's um, gonna be our last days of using the traditional posiconazole suspension. When this comes out, this is gonna overtake it um, because you just get so, so much better levels. Okay, so the new kid on the block, acevuconazole in children. So um, there's the you know, pivotal non-inferiority trial showing that acevuconazole was as good as voriconazole for mold and aspergillosis. And it's only recently Antonio Arrieta published his, his PK study and safety study in children. Um, so let's unpack this study. So it was a very uh, PK rich um, sample size of 46 patients and over 500 plasma concentrations. And he looked at giving it at 10 meg per keg load with a 10 meg per keg um, daily dose, whether or not it achieves um, similar AUCs and levels to that randomized controlled trial in adults. And what he did show in his safety analysis that it would have had similar uh, adverse effect profile. So um, what he found that when you give it IV, it's pretty good in children. And when you give it in, in uh, orally, you're getting decent AUCs also. So um, I guess this is, is a good um, uh, direction towards a savioconazole to consider TDM, um, especially in children. And um, uh, although there's no um, defined targets of trough levels by our TDM gurus in adult land, 
if you look in the text, uh, there are descriptions to say uh, you sh should probably target a trough level above one milligram per litre and TDM um, is your quality assurance. So concluding remarks, um, yeah, TDM has a strong utility, especially in kids when there's a lot of gaps in evidence. We don't have, a, we don't have those phase three randomized controlled trials at, uh, in children. Um, appreciate the, uh, the similarities and differences, especially in posaconazole and voriconazole. Know what's causing that intra-patient variability. Appreciate that next time when you give your dose recommendation when you see your next level. And what's really exciting to me is this new posaconazole powder for suspension and TDM of isaviconazole in children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Really appreciate um, your presentation. It was a great overview of the um, antifungals in optimal dosing in paediatrics.